Serenity now! Serenity now! <laughs> what is that? Doctor gave me a relaxation cassette. When my blood pressure gets too high, the man on the tape tells me to say, Serenity now! But I don't want to be a secondary character. <laughs> Steven, you're not getting my water pick. Serenity now. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of But I Don't Want to Be a Secondary Character. My name's Ivan. I'm Steven. And this week we are doing our final Season 9 episode of this podcast series and our third last episode overall. We're talking about the Serenity Now and its secondary characters. Yeah, a uh, classic from Season 9 and one of the most famous Seinfeld lines to ever emerge from the show, without a doubt. Yes, yeah, Serenity Now, Insanity Later. Yeah, I, I forgot about the Insanity Later part until uh, I watched this episode for, uh, you know, our episode of the podcast. Completely forgot about that part and then I watched it I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's part of the, you know, it's, it's not as well known as Serenity Now, but. Yeah, completely uh, slipped my mind. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good one. And it's the last time we see Lloyd Braun in the whole thing. Lots of finals this week. Lots of finals. Lots of finals. I know we're so close to the end. It's very sad. Yeah, it is sad. If you've been with us from the start, this we just ticked over our four-year anniversary. And yeah, it's been a, a hell of a ride. And our last two episodes, we've got some special guests on, one who you know and uh, a new brand new one, but uh, we'll reveal those details a bit later, which we're excited mm. about. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's all coming into an end. So lots of feelings, like Jerry in this uh, in this episode, lots of feelings. What is this salty discharge, Stephen? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll be crying <laughs> and, and trying to figure out what the salty discharge is on our final episode in a couple of weeks. If you want to tell us what the salty discharge coming out of our eyes is, uh, you can send us an email and tell us what it is, bitofabasspodcast at gmail.com. And uh, you can find us on social media at beyond. I-D-W-B-A-S-C, and you can support us financially as well. That's right. We do have a PayPal if you just want to make a one-off donation to support us. If you want to subscribe to something a bit more regular, uh, you can sign up to our Patreon uh, for a couple of bucks a month. You do get access to our normal episodes like this one a week earlier, as well as all of our bonus content like uh, Curbcast, which we've just finished season three for. And uh, we've also just finished uh, season 11, which is our second fictional uh, season of Seinfeld. We did season 10 a couple of years ago and uh, mm. season 11 has sort of been uh, completed over the last sort of six months or so. And uh, we've also got a bit of a catalog of movie reviews and interviews and all sorts of bits and pieces. So even though we are coming to an end, you want to get access to that content you can sign up and uh we will be after this podcast bid will bask ends uh, we have a lot of things uh, in the pipeline so um you can sort of subscribe to that uh, as an early supporter for our future projects as well yes indeed so yeah be sure to go there and all the links are in the show notes so today buddy uh seinfeld isms so what's happened to you in in the real life regarding seinfeld yeah so i've had two this week two repeat seinfeld isms one <laughs> podcast is again mention of Seinfeld in a podcast. I uh, didn't make Love note that. of which podcast or what the reference was, but just, you know, clocked it. And uh, I think this is my third <laughs> uh, of this Seinfeldism, which is I was driving in Richmond, which is a suburb here in uh, inner Melbourne where we live. And uh, I saw the big Larry David mural for the-, um, the Latte uh, Larry. Latte yeah. Larry's. Latte Larry's. What about you? Oh, a couple of oldies and goodies, eh? Yeah, that's right. Classic. No, none for me this week, unfortunately, but hopefully I do get at least one more before we finish. Yeah, you've we'll got see. to go out and scope it. You've just got to go out and create one for yourself. So that you've got <laughs> I'll find like a soup restaurant and I'll see if the chef's like a Nazi or something <laughs> and see if just, I can piss him off. Yeah, just something. call ahead or I don't yeah. know. Just, um, I don't know, try and have some shiksa appeal or I don't know. Just, just do yeah, something. put just, cucumber on my pizza. Yeah. Just cut it up and, and put it like order a pizza and then just put cucumber on it. Yeah, that's I can. I could put your uh, your wet clothes in my oven like last week's in uh, the calzone. You know, all sorts. Yeah. yeah, we can make all sorts. We can of have a debate stuff. about whether the cucumber, you know, should go on top of the pizza <laughs> yep, or whatever. That's true. Like yeah. popping and Kramer. I mentioned before that you know if you want to be a subscriber for our future projects, you might think it's podcasts and stuff, but we're actually starting a make your own pie restaurant. So you know, you can get in on the ground on <laughs> that too. Yeah, we are. I wonder how we're going to ship them to our American and Canadian listeners and our uh, European ones. Oh, I don't know. We'll have to set up a you know partner with. With a, a, a pizza franchise over there to so they can make it and distribute it locally. DoorDash, fifteen dollars off your first order. <laughs> Text Serenity now. <laughs> I'll put Serenity now as the code. Uh, we'd be delisted off delivery apps so quickly. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, <laughs> we probably get no one who'd sign up anyway. Yeah, so. Delivery is either not <laughs> showing up, it. or if they come from Australia, cold, hard, you know, rotten pizzas with cucumber. On. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. and Newman would be the delivery driver. You'd only get half exactly. your order. Yeah, and I mean it rains a lot in Melbourne, so he wouldn't work, and it, it would all just be a disaster. He'd be off like a hundred days a year. Oh, for sure. You know, I just said if you want to support our pizza, uh, our Make Your Empire restaurant, upon second thought, don't do that because you. No, don't, please. 
keep your money in your pocket. That's right. Yeah, order order pizza from a real pizza shop. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Disregard us. Anyway, buddy, Seinfeld News, how many pieces do you have this week? Uh, so I searched high and low. Uh, I almost came up with zero. Nothing has happened really in the Seinfeld world. But uh, I decided to include one just so I could talk about something. And it's not even really related to Seinfeld. It's got a very tenuous reference. But uh, the famous cellist, Yo-Yo Ma, he threw the week. Yo-Yo Ma. Yo-Yo Ma. He gave a- Yo-Yo Ma. Yeah, Yo-Yo Ma. What'd you say? Yo-Yo Ma. <laughs> He's a cellist. <laughs> he made an impromptu performance at a uh, vaccination center in uh, New York. So basically, okay. he rolled up, uh, he set up, and uh, he decided to play a set to the people, you know, the medical staff working there and the people that were there to get um, some vaccines. And uh, he basically, uh, he gave like a little interview after the performance. Uh, he gave an interview to the Berkshire Eagle, which is like a local paper. And um, he basically just said he wanted to give something back, you know. He felt um, that the medical workers and the the people, you know, had gone through a lot, like everyone in the last year or so, and he wanted to do something to just, you know, give a little back to their lives, which is really sweet. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Good, good on Yo-Yo Ma. That's right. And uh, it is worth noting as well, he was there to get his vaccine as well. So it wasn't just to sort of perform. Yeah, yeah. It's like, all right, I've performed. See you guys later. Enjoy yep. your vaccine. And yeah. uh, <laughs> in case uh, it's still clear to you, Yo-Yo Ma is related to Seinfeld because in the episode, I believe it's The Ticket, when uh, Kramer gets kicked in the head by Joe Davola, a crazy Joe Davola, he's a bit mm-hmm. uh, he's a bit loopy and he's you know struggling to think straight. And when Jerry, George and Kramer are all deciding to, who should pay for the dry cleaning bill after Kramer um, vomits on Susan's, I think, blouse or jacket or something like that. Uh, the first time they introduce to each other, you know, yeah, they, they meet right. each other. Yeah, he throws mm. up on her and um, it's because he drank some uh, some rotten milk in Jerry's fridge and they're trying to sort of argue, you know, who's liable, who should pay for the, the dry cleaning. And they all agree yeah. to go in on it together. And then in that conversation, Kramer just randomly goes, yo-yo ma. And, uh, yo-yo ma. Yeah, that's Jerry, the reference. Yeah, Jerry, Jerry's really confused and uh, a bit <laughs> concerned. Yeah, but, you know, he comes good. But uh, yeah, that's that's the reference and that's the only reason why I yeah. included it in Seinfeld News this week. Nice. I'm sure most of the listeners would have already known that, but it's good for those who are watching the show for the first time. Yeah, it's a good good thing to know. Yeah, I mean, it is a well-known Seinfeld, uh, or sorry, like a Kramer line. You know, it's just so random. And Yo-Yo Ma is such a memorable name. Even if you don't really know Mm. who he is or what he does, it's just such a a unique name. It's very memorable. But, um, you know, it is, at the same time, it is a fairly obscure reference, especially for Seinfeld news. Yeah, yeah. Nice. (laughs) Yo-Yo Ma. Yo-Yo Ma. Yo-Yo Ma. All right, we're talking about the Serenity Now and its secondary characters. Serenity Now was from season nine. It is the third episode of the final series or season of Seinfeld. First aired in the US on October 9th, 1997, directed by Andy Ackerman and written by Steve Corrin. In this episode, Frank sets up a new business selling computers and hires George and Lloyd Braun, Matt McCoy, to compete against each other in a sales contest. But Frank's relaxation technique drives everybody completely nuts. Jerry's new girlfriend, Patty, Laurie Lachlan, encourages him to let his emotions out. Kramer takes Frank's screen door and puts it up on his apartment, creating any town USA. But the local kids make relaxation difficult for him. Elaine discovers her shiska appeal and suddenly every Jewish man in New York, including her former boss Lipman, Richard Fancy, is attracted to her. And a couple of other secondary characters in the episode, Ross Malinga plays Adam Lipman, uh, Mr. Lipman's son, and Bruce Marler makes another appearance as Rabbi Glickman. So trivia for the episode, Steve. This plot or the episode's plot was inspired by the real life events in the life of Steve Corrin and uh, apparently while he was driving with his arguing parents, Corrin was bewildered to hear his father shout serenity now at the top of his lungs. As part of a rage controlling exercise, his doctor told him and uh, Steve said to his dad, surely you don't need to yell it. Yeah, and that was uh, directly lifted and inserted into this episode and uh, I realised that the name Stephen Corrin is familiar I thought, I know that from somewhere and it's actually uh, one of the characters in uh, what episode is it where? The Van Buren boys, he plays the kid with the two GPA. Uh, yeah, level two right. GPA, yeah. and he gets that scholarship. Yeah, yeah. But he's like <laughs> right, right on the curve. Yeah, that's right. He's he's <laughs> like a you know before he joins the Van Buren boys, he's a little protege of uh, Costanza's. Yeah, but he's actually he's not like smart or anything. He's just like an average kid. Yeah, and that's what that's what attracts Costanza to him. You know, the fact that uh, yeah, yeah. he can't really be upstaged by an average kid. Yeah, but the name of the character, he was named after the, uh, Steve, yeah, the same guy. <laughs> so, yeah, it's funny how, like, imagine, you know, you're with, like, your, or, like, a relative or a parent or whatever, and then suddenly they just yell out something random, like, at the top of their lungs, and you're like, you're right. Yeah. And they're like, oh, my doctor told me to yell it. 
I know my doctor told me the same. And then you'd be like, surely, you know, don't forget yellow. That's a bit, uh, I don't know, it's not really good for you. Yeah, it's a bit um, it's a bit bewildering and uh, I'd be very confused. And, you know, I'd try and be supportive. I'd say, okay, well, if that's, uh, you know, if that's helping you out, okay. But uh, it yeah. would be it would be a bit awkward at first, I think, for sure. Yeah, if your mum suddenly yelled serenity now, you'd be like, uh. <laughs> I think you watch too much Seinfeld, mum. Yeah, I'd just be like, mum, you'd need to, you know, watch something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I know, it's just, yeah, it's just funny how they, yeah, you're right. They lifted it straight from Steve's, you know, family life into the episode. It's brilliant. Yeah, they do that a lot, but uh, this is one of the better storylines I think they've lifted into real life. And I like, you know, For sure. a lot of the time when we talk about these sort of trivia points, the storyline in the episode is always an adaptation of what's happened in life. You know, they change a few details or they've just cherry picked bits and pieces and put them in the episode. But this is just a one for one lift. You know, just the only difference is that it's actors portraying characters, but it's a child with two parents in the car. You know, it's a one for one copy, mm. which I really love. Yeah, you're one for one. But I don't think Steve is as insane as George, though. He's probably more temperamental. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize it wouldn't be nuts. The first bit of trivia I have in this is not something I realized until reading it uh, for this episode is the uh, sales contest between George and uh, Lloyd Braun is actually a parody of a 1992 film, a film I haven't seen, but I've definitely heard of called Glen Gary, Glen Ross, which I imagine oh. has something to do with salespeople selling stuff. Oh, yeah. That's a, is that to have Alec Baldwin in it? I think he's oh, in it and maybe yeah. someone else. It's like, yeah, it's like some un, like now it's not not really talked about but yep. yeah it was a film in the 90s i think it might have had alec baldwin i Actually, might double yeah. check if it's the one that you're talking about i have seen a famous scene from it where there's a room of sales mostly salesmen and they need some inspiration yeah. they're not getting the sales targets and uh alec baldwin is just an absolute gun and he comes in for you know for a oh, yeah. inspiration for them but he he basically berates them and he's basically saying you know he's abusive towards them saying you know if you're not closing sales then you're just a worthless piece of shit and uh i think he hmm. There's a couple of classic lines in that in that scene. It's it's a it's a infamous scene um, and a famous scene as well. If it's if it's the same movie, then I've seen that scene, but not the rest of the movie. Yeah, apparently it's it's a it's a 1992 American drama film based on the Pulitzer Prize winning play of the same name. Uh, right. It depicts two days in the lives of four real estate salesmen and how desperate yep. they become when the corporate office sends a trainer to motivate them. Yeah, that's yep. the one. Yeah, I think the trainer yep. is Alec Baldwin, and he's just yeah, and he tells them and he tells them in a week's time all except the top two salesmen will be fired. So yeah. Yep. It, it's it's from that film. Geez, what a cast though. Al Pacino, Jack Lemon, Alec Baldwin, Ed Harris, Alan Harkin, Kevin Spacey, and Jonathan Price. Jesus Holy Christ. Shit. What a cast. Yeah. Just one more. So Kramer mentions to Jerry that he was ambushed uh, with eggs by the neighborhood kids. And uh, one of them is Joey Sanfino. He's the kid who, uh, you know, a few weeks ago we did the foundation. That's the one where Kramer kicks the shit out of him and his friends in the karate class. And uh, Kramer previously babysat for him in the wait out. So really they exact, you know, they beat the crap out of Kramer in the alley, but they didn't think that they were revenge was complete so they needed to egg him in his house no. too yeah and especially with what kramer put them through i don't blame him you know joey yeah. and his mates are just like you know, the neighborhood kids are just <laughs> destroying him yeah i mean they all they all got in one beating to kramer but kramer got in repeat beatings so you know yeah it still needs to be evened out yeah plus they're a bit older too so you know they're uh you know more rebellious they're probably getting close to teenagehood <laughs> by that That's stage true. so they're like fuck it let's get this guy yeah teenage level pranks as well you know egging and then um shaving cream is his uh screen door and stuff makes Who'd sense Mama. <laughs> Hoochie mama. Hoochie mama. Uh, Hoochie mama. <laughs> the last bit of trivia I have, and uh, it's it's quite obvious because, um, you know, it was an extremely famous film at the time and still is. Uh, but when Frank is describing his inspiration for his new computer business to his son, George, he talks about having seen, as he describes, the very provocative, <laughs> which I, him using that word to describe the net, which is the film he says inspired him, uh, just, yeah. just tickles me. A very provocative film. <laughs> um, <laughs> provocative. Yeah, it's I mean, just like a popcorn. You know, yeah, it's like it's like, like in the 90s how everything was like, you know, tech, cyber, yeah, and it was just like so yeah. outdated. Yeah, I mean, for a 90s hacker film, it actually kind of stands the test of time, especially compared to a lot of others. But yeah, it was very stylized and, you know, looking back now, very, very silly. But, uh, you know, I guess to someone like Frank, who's maybe a bit out of touch with the world and definitely out of touch with computer technology, I can understand why it would be provocative. But just the way he mm. uses that word to describe that film just really, really tickles me. Anyway, that's not <laughs> the trivia. Um, no. But uh, he <laughs> says that the film The Net, which again inspired him, had that w that girl from The Bus, which uh, is obviously referring mm -hmm. to Speed. So that's, that's yes. the trivia I have. But one point I just wanted to ask you is when he says the girl from the bus, 
Mm. I think it can be interpreted in two ways, interpreted in two ways. One being the bus is the title of what he thinks is the title of the film. So, you know, capital, the capital bus or just lowercase the bus, like that girl from the bus, like just describing the fact that the film has a bus in it, not the bus being the title of the film. And I couldn't figure out- Oh, good question. You know, is he just saying, yeah, that girl from the bus, you know, the bus was in the film and that's the only thing I remember? Or is he? does he think the film is actually called The Bus, that girl from The I Bus? Thought, I thought he was called The Bus. That's right. That was my interpretation. I thought yeah. maybe because Sandra Bullock is obviously the actress in question, but yeah. I, I thought that maybe he thought that, you know, maybe Sandra Bullock appears in like films with The at the start of him. So she's oh, like yeah, in the, the net, net the, the bus. bus, The, 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 you know. Okay. Yeah. But, but he, he could mean maybe the girl, like maybe he couldn't identify the actress, you know, Sandra Bullock. And so he thought, oh, yeah, it's just the girl who was on the bus in that film. I guess yeah. it could go either way, really. But I, I like the idea where Frank thinks that the name of the film is The Bus. Yeah, he not only thinks The Net is a provocative film, but that speed mm. is called The Bus. <laughs> yeah, he, he's so he's so insane that he could, you know, he'd think that the film is actually called The Bus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It reminds me of that classic Simpsons scene where uh, Homer is talking to Lenny and Carl and he's, last night I watched a movie about a bus that couldn't slow, uh, you know, bus that couldn't slow down or, you know, and its speed couldn't go below 50. But if its speed got up, you know, he kept on saying speed, 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 speed. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I think it's called the bus that couldn't slow down. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Another guy who couldn't get the name. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Speed, speed <laughs> Any- is obviously a tricky title to remember. Oh, geez. Yeah, I know. Five, five letters. <laughs> Too much. Too much for me. That's right. (laughs) Too much. Anyway, let's take a quick break, man. And when we come back, let's talk about some secondary characters from the Serenian now. I've got notes on Adam Lippman, Paddy, and uh, just a little bit on Lloyd Braun. We've already done an episode on him and we spoke about him in the Non-Fat Yogurt a couple of weeks ago, but maybe we can touch on him in his final stages of insanity. What do you think? Yeah, for sure. And I've got uh, a note or two on Frank. And again, we've done episodes on them specifically, and uh, we've talked about them at length in all the episodes I've appeared in. You know, we always miss uh, a point or two. We do an episode with a popular secondary character. And uh, I just have an extra note or two on Rabbi Glickman as well. Oh, yeah, very good. Anyway, let's have a quick break and we'll come back and chat about them. Hello, folks. Matt McCoy here, a.k.a. Lloyd Braun from Seinfeld. And I'm telling you right now, I do not want to be a secondary character. We're talking about the Serenity now and its secondary characters for our third last episode of Bidwa Bask. And Steve, let's talk about the main secondary character in the episode, or first time secondary, I should say, Patty. She's played by Laurie Lachlan. She's most famous for playing Becky in the 90s sitcom Full House, as well as its 2010s reboot Fuller House. Uh, she's also had a starring role in the TV series Summerland, and she's appeared in other TV shows, including 90210, Spin City, and Hudson Street. And uh, Laurie Lachlan uh, made headlines a couple of years ago regarding uh, Colin college uh, scam. Yeah, the college admission scandal. She was caught up in a scandal which I think involved around 20 or 30 people, um, mm. many of them of high note, um, most of them sort of wealthy people who had access to, you know, powerful people, I guess. And uh, yeah, I'm sure you've maybe heard about the college admission scandal. It's a really interesting tale. There was a really good podcast series actually put out. I think there's a podcast called Gangster Capitalism and every season is like a six or eight part series about like a complex, long white collar crime. And in this I think season two or three, which came out last year, it was about the college admission scandal and it's really, really good. Yeah. But yeah. She, she basically, her and her husband and a whole bunch of other people paid a lot of money to this one guy who had access to, you know, a lot of sports coaches and, and sort of the, the movers and shakers within Harvard and Yale and the, the top Ivy League schools in America. And they basically bribed their way in to get kids, you mm. know, pretend scholarships so that they were guaranteed spots, even if they had average grades. So yeah, pretty controversial. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a shame that, you know, an actress like Laurie Lachlan and especially a Seinfeld alumni got decided to to do that and got caught up in a in a pretty uh pretty shitty situation. Yeah, pretty shitty situation, but uh we're not talking about her though. <laughs> but I guess we can we're going to talk about Patty, but yes, yeah, a very shitty situation all around. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, Patty, I, I reckon Steve, as soon as I saw her scenes and I like, you know, watched the episode, I think she's only in like two or three scenes anyway. Watched her last scene where she leaves Jerry and walks out. I've picked her as possibly a psychologist or someone in that field. Yeah. Yeah, no, I had exactly the same thing. I just said therapist, you know, which is, yep. you know, it could be a psychologist or psychiatrist. I'm thinking more psychologist. I'm more thinking more psychologist too. Yeah. I, I feel like she's probably like, she's probably so intrigued by Jerry with mm-hmm. the fact that he doesn't show any emotions. So she probably wants to try and get him to become emotional. Yep. So do you yep. think she sees him as a bit of a, a puzzle to solve more than a potential boyfriend or maybe a bit of both? Probably a bit of both. Yep. 
Yeah. Uh, what about I, you? Yeah, no, no. I think that's a pretty good take. I just wanted to clarify why I think psychologist more than say psychiatrist is because she's more interested in uh, Jerry being emotionally expressive than a take that a psychiatrist might have, which is a bit more clinical, a bit more medicinal, which might be, hey, maybe Jerry, you've got depression. You know, I think if she was a psychiatrist, she'd probably go down the medication, uh, you know, clinical route more than, hey, maybe let's just talk about how you feel, which is more of a psychologist angle. Yeah, but I think I think she likes Jerry beyond his inability to express emotions. I think she, you know, likes him on some level. But yeah, I think initially she was attracted to because you know the the, the stereotype of someone who is not emotional or is completely shut off is either someone who's extremely depressed or maybe even a psychopath or a sociopath. And Jerry is neither of those. You know, he, he can be cruel and cold and careless, but he's, mm. he's well adjusted. You know, he's got his, his, you know, he's not depressed. He's functional. He's got a good life. He's got a, you know, he, he doesn't have any signs of psychopathy or depression, but the fact that he's emotionally empty, I think would be very intriguing to her. Yeah. Very intriguing and something that she wouldn't come across, you know, every yeah, day. I'm sure in her clinical life or her, her professional life, she comes across a lot of emotionally either shut off or just completely, you know, emotionally people who can't, who don't have the capacity for emotions. And I would, yeah. I would wager that most of those people would either be again, severely depressed or maybe just sociopaths. And Jerry is in either one of those. So he's a bit of an anomaly in terms of someone who's emotionally closed off but doesn't fit a typical category of why that is. Yeah, and that and that's what makes him intriguing to her. Yeah, he's he's you know, he seems well adjusted, he's pretty comfortable in his own skin, he's he's kind of upbeat, you know, he's he's a comedian, but he's got no emotions. So yeah, that that would be hmm. a very big puzzle to solve. And- <laughs> Massive puzzle. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it doesn't take much to, I mean, even though Jerry's justification for staying with her is that she's got a good body, it, it doesn't take much to sort of bring it out of him. You know, she, she doesn't have to do a whole lot to encourage for him to express. And when, when it does happen, you know, it, it comes out like a like a flood, you know, and it really pisses off George and Elaine, especially, you know, they get sick of it real quick. Yeah. I mean, it's like suppressed emotions for the last, what, 35, 36 years <laughs> that Jerry's yeah. been alive or fictional Jerry anyway. And suddenly, you know, if things are just bottled up and they come out, then it's not just like a drip, drip, drip. It's like a massive flood, like you said. Yeah. And I mean, the point that I'm about to make isn't about Patty per se, but I think it's worth, you know, Jerry's one of the most well-known aspects of his character. And, you know, to a certain extent, the other core four uh, or the others in the core four is that they are emotionally shut off. And I don't think Jerry, I think Jerry intentionally shuts off his emotions. I don't think it's involuntary. Like, I just don't know how to be expressive. I think he knows how to be expressive, but he just does it because it's too much to deal with. The fact that it's it's right there on the edge and Patty doesn't have to do much to get out of him to me demonstrates that he does have emotions. They're in there. He says that he's empty. He says, you know, I'm open, but there's just nothing there. I don't think that's there's true. Because if there was nothing yeah. there, it wouldn't be so easy for Patty to get the emotions out of him. I think there is something there and he keeps them at bay intentionally because, you know, for whatever reason. Adding to that as well, I, yeah, I think his emotions are skin deep. But yeah. I think with Jerry, he's such a man child and he doesn't, he wants to like, he's almost got like a Peter Pan complex. Yeah. He doesn't really want to grow up and I don't think he wants the responsibility of being an adult. So he'd rather, you know, because obviously, with responsibilities, you know, things come out, emotions come out and things can get pretty hectic, you know, depending on what you're doing. But I think Jerry just wants to live in like that, you know, childhood fantasy kind of world, you know, with his baseball, his comedy. And yeah, I think you're right. I I think it's more of like a voluntary suppression of his emotions. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, just when he said, you know, I'm I'm open, there's just nothing there. I'm like, that's not true. Because if there was nothing there, then nothing would come out, but it comes out very easily. So yeah. Very easily. Yeah. yeah, And and adding adding to your point about Patty being a psychologist rather than a psychiatrist, oh, a psychologist psychologist rather than a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist wouldn't try and let their patients get emotional and angry. You know, they would, like you said, they'd use medicine and, and therapies to try and assist. But a psychiatrist, I think it would be unethical if a psychiatrist tried making you mad or making you cry. You know what I mean? I think that probably, surely there'd be some ethical boundaries that have been crossed there. Yeah, I would um, imagine the same. Yeah, a, a, a psychiatrist, you know, they want the same outcome, which is someone to be more emotionally stable or healthy. But yeah, they would go about it in a different way. And um, um, yeah, I think, I think yeah. If Patty was a psychiatrist and she was genuinely interested in helping Jerry be more emotionally expressive, she would take a much more clinical, methodical approach, not just "Hey, let's talk about stuff while we're you know having lunch at Monk" sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that's why that's why I think yeah, for the psychology aspect, she just yeah, she's very intrigued by Jerry and uh, she kind of wants to put the puzzle together, like you said. Yeah, and I mean, she you know she kind of starts to I guess put the puzzle together or encourage him to be more emotionally expressive, but he does a full one eighty and he just I guess it's to count to um, make up for the fact that he hasn't been angry for you know, assuming most of his life, if not his entire adult life, you know, he's, he's just operating on anger for a little while. He's sort of balancing it out. And she has, 
you know, I'm sure she's seen a lot of, you know, emotionally unstable people, you know, maybe her safety has been threatened or her emotional well-being has been compromised. You know, that is a common thing amongst any sort of like, you know, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, it takes a toll on them emotionally, even if they do a lot yeah. to, to put the boundaries up, it still kind of leaks into their life. I think Jerry, you know, trying to navigate his newfound emotions, even though it doesn't last long, <laughs> it gets, it gets <laughs> shut right off when George. Oh, with George, you've scared me straight. Yeah. The fact, the fact <laughs> I love that. that. Yeah, he scared me straight. I don't think that's happening. He doesn't work here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then Elaine comes in to say, let's do it. Let's get married. And Jerry's yeah. like, oh, I don't think so. Yeah, he's like, he doesn't work here anymore. <laughs> he doesn't work here anymore. I don't think Patty expected Jerry's opening up to be so sudden and so much. I think maybe of she expected not. to be a bit more of like, you know, I'm going to gently coax it out of him and eventually it'll build up. But it just, once it's out and once he realizes that it feels good to be angry and emotionally honest, it's, it's a bit too much for her and she just has zero tolerance she's like no nah, i'm out like she doesn't yeah and i think that's to protect herself emotionally because you know this is someone she's sort of you know she's sort of set something off she's set something in motion that she doesn't you know she didn't expect to happen so quickly and she's also romantically involved in him so there's a lot of complications there and she just goes you know i think she just makes the decision then and there you know what i don't know how this will end it could end mm. in a bad way you know maybe jerry will in violence with emotions and yeah he'll probably get too violent maybe he'll start being physical or, or- yeah, yeah, put himself huh. in danger or like, it, it, you know, the outcome is unpredictable. And also the fact that maybe she realized the error of her ways as well. Like, oh, I actually saw him more as a as a potential patient or puzzle than than a, than a lover. And she yeah. thought, you know what, I've just got to hit the ejector seat, you know, and, and him getting angry at her for no reason was just the opportunity for her to do that. Yeah. And even something dumb like Spanish Chinese fusion food. Yep. Yeah. She just got, he just got so angry. But that was another thing I thought about as well regarding Patty. She loves Spanish Chinese fusion food. I don't know. It's an odd, uh, odd fusion, but uh, no, she seems to enjoy it a lot. She wants to go there all the time. Yeah. I, I would assume that maybe she's just a adventurous, you know, an, an adventurous eater, you know, outside of her, yeah. her clinical practice or a therapy practice. She, that might be one of her, her interests or hobbies. You know, she likes yeah, yeah. Uh, exploring new food boundaries. <laughs> Just off the top of your head, what could you imagine a Spanish Chinese fusion dish as being like? I'm thinking uh, maybe, you know, like empanadas, yeah. maybe like the empanada filling in a dumpling or something. Yep. No, that'd work. Yeah. What, well, what about thinking, you? Was there anything off the top of your head? Well, the first like thing I think of when I think of Spanish food is tapas. And, yeah. you know, I could imagine tapas style food, but but Chinese, like tapas style serving, you know, small portions on a lot of plates, but Chinese yeah. food. So. Oh, I mean, yeah, that could work. You know, or, or paella with more Chinese ingredients as opposed to Spanish ingredients. Don't know. <laughs> That'll work, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you could combine. You know, most, most cultures' foods, even if they're very unique, there is a lot of um, crossover, you know, like there's always there's always similarities you could use to combine them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and, and sometimes they're so familiar or similar yeah. to the other culture that you mix them together and they're almost seamless. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, this yeah. is not directly related to what we're saying, but, you know, a, a lot everyone uh, attributes pasta and especially spaghetti to Italy and you know rightfully so it is the sort of the cornerstone of there and and you Ivan your food culture um mm, yeah but you know if you go all the way back I believe that pasta or spaghetti in its original form actually came from China and Italian it did, yeah yeah, and Italian cuisine and Spanish cuisine is a lot closer together or, or a lot, you know, being in the same sort of area of the world, they use a lot of similar ingredients compared to China. So, you know, there's there are sort of real life links if you really, really put it all together. Yeah, I mean, they're all linked together, you know, <laughs> for th- thousands of years or linked together for thousands of years of, uh, of cooking. That's right. And I mean, you know, there's, yeah. there's a couple of ingredients that tie it all together. I think one is probably garlic. I think garlic is used in every cuisine. That's basically and, uh, universal, except in yeah. Transylvania, they don't need it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> The one place. The one place. (laughs) Not at Vlad's house. You you can never get a good garlic chicken at Vlad's. It's funny though, in Transylvania, they've got the least the least amount of bad breath. So that's one benefit. (laughs) They do, yes. You know. Uh, no garlic, oh so they've got bad immune systems, but they've got great breath. So, you know, it's a trade off. Tic tacs, you know, they don't sell them there. You know, they oh. think this is terrible market. We gotta, we gotta go somewhere else. Exactly. You know, like, well, no one's got bad. There's no demand for this here. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but anyway, Patty, did you have any other notes on her? Uh, no, that's it. We yeah. Did a, you know, we did a pretty deep dive, and we got a lot out of it, considering she's only in a couple of scenes, and she doesn't have like a wider range of, you know, character. Uh, expression, you know, not a lot to work with. But I think considering how little we had to work with in terms of material and 
what she showed of herself, we, you know, we, we got a lot out of it. Oh, well, we did. And unlike other episode girlfriends, Steve, with Patty, she's not really like, because, you know, a lot of episode girlfriends have like an idiosyncrasy, you know, that Jerry yeah. either puts up with or doesn't like. But the joke is actually not Patty, but it's actually the joke is what happened to Jerry after Patty, you know, did that thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. He's, he's the one with the strange alien quality to who he normally is. Yeah. Where it's usually the episode girlfriends with the alien quality. Yeah, that's right. Something different, yeah. And I like, like Laurie Lachlan, I like how she just played, you know, played the role straight. She didn't like try and become like a comedian or anything like that. Yeah, she just played it like, like straight. It's good. Yeah, no, she's, um, you know, she's a very, I think she's a very thoughtful, well-adjusted woman. She's, you know, she's trying to encourage Jerry to be like, hey, it's it's actually unhealthy to bottle up your emotions. Why don't you give it a go? Let him out. Um, <laughs> yeah, and what then, a mistake. And then she sees what she's unleashed and she's like, no, no, I'm, I'm out. This is not as I thought it would be. So I think, you know, she's a very smart, switched on woman. Yeah, yeah. Because she, like you said, she probably had experience in the past with strain, like stalkers and stuff. Yeah, or just, you know, she's probably mm-hmm. seen a fair share of emotional instability and, uh, you know, I guess because Jerry's not a client, making him, not that it's her fault that Jerry becomes angry, but that was the outcome of her encouraging it. At least with a patient, there's a professional boundary there. You know, there's no, it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't uh, interfere with her personal life. You know, she, if someone becomes emotionally unstable and she feels a bit unsafe or a bit unsure of how it will turn out, there's at least, you know, a boundary between her professional setting and her personal life. Whereas Jerry, you know, it's blurred together. So I think that's made the decision easier for her. She's like, well, I can't just treat him as a, as a patient. I've got to, no. you know, he's also up until she breaks up with him. He's also her boyfriend. So yeah. Yeah. Just, just cut him loose. Yeah. Just, you know, better for everyone. <laughs> Indeed. Anyway, let's talk about Adam Lipman, huh? Sure. Played by Ross Malinga. He's most famous for playing Tom Hanks's character's son in the film Sleepless in Seattle. Oh, He's no. the one that gets him and Meg Ryan together. Yep, he calls into yep. the radio station and stuff, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. I think it's something like that. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen that movie in pff, years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's. I think he. I think he. Yeah, hooks up. You know, his dad with Meg Ryan somehow. Or yeah, yeah. Whatever. He's the. Yeah. He's their. Um. Their Cupid. The Cupid. That's right. He's the matchmaker. The little boy. <laughs> he's also appeared in Sudden Death and Nick Frino, licensed teacher. So yeah, I mean, he's a he's a thirteen year old boy. Obviously, the hormones are raging. You know, he'll uh, <laughs> he'll want to have sex with anything that moves at that age. So you know, his hormones are flying, and yeah, he sees Elaine, and uh, you know, in that moment, sees like a beautiful woman and kisses her. Well, obviously, that gag of him, you know, like a thirteen year old boy kissing a like a thirty five year old woman, probably wouldn't fly today. I don't think that would really be allowed on TV. It's probably a bit too much. No, (laughs) definitely a dated joke. I think so. For many, uh, I, for obviously, for obvious reasons. Yeah. I mean, obviously he is, you know, I mean, even though he's a teenager, he is, you know, by he's technically sexually assaulting her. So uh, yeah. I guess the one silver lining is that he does seem receptive to Elaine telling him what not to do. You know, Elaine sort of sits him down and says, you know, basically don't do that because I didn't want you to do that. And you, you're not sort of allowed to do that without the other person's permission. And he yeah. doesn't seem, he doesn't seem too... Uh, what's the word? You know, he seems he seems like he's at least open. You know, he's trying to he's trying to understand. Like he's thirteen, so he's not yeah. very emotionally developed, and he probably doesn't grasp you know things like consent and complex topics and stuff like that. But he doesn't seem too adverse to it. You know, he's at least trying to understand no. maybe what he did wrong, which I think is a you know if there is a silver lining in Adam doing some not nice things to Elaine, it's it's that at least he's for a thirteen year old, he seems mature enough to want to try and understand why he should. Yeah, have, I uh, think lunged it lunged at Elaine and kissed her. Yeah. I, I'm kind of glad they did go this route because even though it was like even the 90s, you know, there was some kind of, you know, like humor that probably wouldn't fly today. I appreciate the fact that Steve Corrin, you know, the writer of the episode, he decided to kind of make Adam, re- you know, redeem himself for what he's done. Yeah. Like, I'm glad they didn't just make him like a sleazy kid because I think that probably would have been like really extreme. Yeah, it was it was a from a writer's point of view, it provided the character of Adam with a learning opportunity. And again, even though he didn't fully grasp why Elaine was bothered by it and the words she was trying to say to him, you know, you could see the cogs slowly ticking in his head going, okay, like, you know, and and I'm sure that planted a seed so that when Adam grew up, you know, he had a much more healthy and respectful appreciation for, you know, women's boundaries and just relationships in general. So I think yeah, even though it might not have solved the problem straight away, I think it definitely planted a seed that 
you know, bloomed into a respectful adult later in life. Yeah, I mean, he was born in the right generation. And that's when I guess like the 80s and 90s, you know, all this kind of stuff about, you know, sexual assault and, yeah. you know, equality and stuff. I'm sure that became more mainstream around that time. So he's probably already grown up in the generation, you know, of like equality and, you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, it was actually easier for him. He wasn't like from like the 1920s, you know, <laughs> you know where, where it was pretty, you know, even the 50s where it was quite backwards in that yeah. regard. So uh, yeah, he's probably progressive enough, you know, as a boy to understand what he did was wrong. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, he does push back a bit on it, you know, when Elaine's like, no, no, you, I can't remember the word she uses, but she basically says, you know, I didn't want you to do that. And you sort of, you're not really allowed to do that sort of thing. And he, he does push it back a bit. He's like, but I'm a man, you know, he's like, yeah, which I'm kind of implies that, well, I'm sort of entitled to it in a way, mm. you know, but then she, then she pushes back gently on that. And he's, you know, he, so, he sort of starts to inc- come around and understand that. Oh, okay. So yeah, the, <laughs> the signs are there of someone who matures into a respectful young man, which is, which is good. It's very good. You're 13. And I'm in my early 20s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love at the end, you know, in the last scene we see of Adam, he looks at Elaine and goes, early 20s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> he just, he knows. <laughs> He's like, you're not 20s. Yeah. I don't think Adam is like a bad kid or a creepy kid i think like you said he's he's 13 he's probably caught up in the whole idea of you know the bar mitzvah as well which is a symbolic transition to manhood not a not a literal transition to manhood yeah it's not a legal uh, transition in there no manhood, so yeah. so you know being caught up in that with your hormones i wouldn't be surprised if uh, his dad mr lipman has maybe said a few stories about elaine you know maybe maybe adam's gotten a bit of an idea of who elaine is from Mr. Lippman, because, you know, Mr. Lippman maybe has had a crush on her and he's sort of like not said anything untruthful, but, you know, sort of like sexualized Elaine more than just like, oh, yeah, Elaine's a former colleague of mine sort of thing or a former subordinate of mine. You know, maybe Adam's gotten an impression of who Elaine is and that she kind of wants this maybe from like some comments or something from Mr. Lippman. Mm, I think we've talked about Lippman when we talked about Elaine's bosses in the What's the Deal With episode way back when. I think we did say that Lippman did have a crush on Elaine. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing. Yeah, and you're right. He just probably just talks about Elaine all the time to in front of Adam or to Adam. Yeah, I think it's the way he talks about her as well as the amount that he would talk about her. You know, it's not just if he was just talking about her in neutral terms in that, you know, she's a former employee of mine and she did X, Y, Z. That's different. She's just a person that Mr. Lippman used to know, according to Adam. If Lippman sort of talks about her in like romantic or sexual terms, I think for an impressionable young guy like Adam, it forms an idea of who she is and that she would want me to kiss her. You know, and then he has yeah. an idea when she turns up. And that's, you know, again, it's a nice thing for, I guess, just, you know, as a symbol of progression and for Adam that, you know, that that idea is doesn't last long. No, Good. no, it has consequences. But I'm glad that kind of went that route too. Like yeah, I said. no, it's, it's, it's nice. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, it was unintentionally woke for a, you know, a less <laughs> quote unquote work time. <laughs> a work time. Yeah, it was very, very progressive. And uh, I feel like with Adam, you know, uh, despite all that, all that kind of tension and stuff he has, I feel like he looks up to his father, despite, you yeah. know, Lippmann's failings. He's tried, you know, doing a muffin top store and, you know, he got pen and publishing went under because of his cold and, you know, the translation issues with the uh, Japanese investors and all that yep. sort of thing. And, uh, you know, he's had different, you know, various levels of success in his career, like Elaine puts it to Adam. And uh, yeah, I feel like maybe Adam looks up to his dad yeah i mean adam's still at an age where and it it sort of it happens to different boys and and younger men at different times of their life you know that that whole idea of you know you reach a certain age or a certain thing happens and you realize that your father is not perfect or not you know you you might be better at your father than something or you might you know see him fail or see him something you know you you realize that your father's not a superhero and i think for Mm, adam he still sees even though Lippmann. You know, he's not a failure as a person, but he has had failures, significant failures in his life. And for Adam, you know, whether he chooses to ignore that or whether he's just unaware of it or, you know, whether he doesn't even want to believe it, don't know. Um, Mm. I think he still sees Mr. Lippman as that sort of, you know, my father can do anything. He's my hero. So not just a person, Mm. you know, as as. It's it's very sort of um refreshing when you finally figure out that your parents, you know, are just humans. They have as many flaws and, and shortcomings and regrets and mistakes and whatever else that we all do. You know, I just don't think Adam's at that place in terms of how he sees his father yet. No, he still thinks, like you said, his dad's the superhero. They can do no wrong despite his failings. Yeah. And, you know, this mm. might have actually been the start of that process for him as he, as he thinks about, well, hang on, maybe Elaine is not the way my father talks about him, uh, about her, sorry. You know, and that that sort of, again, you know, he's going through a lot of changes in his life anyway. And I think this might be the start of the how he, you know, he might view his father differently. Yeah. This might be the first step in that that long process. Oh, so deep. (laughs) 
yeah, that's uh, that's what we do. <laughs> we do. We talked about that. Yeah, but anyway, that's all I had about Adam. Really, well, what about you, Bud? The only other thing, the only other note I had is that I think the timing might not work out because you know this is just just at the cusp of the internet becoming you know sort of I guess fairly common amongst most people's homes. Maybe in America it was different, where we were always a few years behind in Australia in the nineties and early two thousands. But uh, at his age as well, he seems his idea of like relationships or or you know physical contact between men and women seems a bit poor. Yeah, yeah. So he's probably gotten an idea of like how men should act with women and vice versa, maybe from porn a bit. He's probably stolen his dad's videos and, you know, like in the 90s, like videos and magazines and watched them. These days, obviously much easier with the internet (laughs) to access that for a kid, but it was a bit harder, but he was still able to do it. And you're right. He had like an idea of, in his mind, what a woman should be. Yeah, and and what they want, Mm. which is just not the case at all. Definitely not. No. Anyway, (laughs) anyway, he became a better kid. That's all I'm going to say. And a better person overall. I think he did. I think he did. Do you have any other notes on, uh, or you had some notes on Lloyd, is that right? Oh, yeah. Look, we've talked about Lloyd Braun a couple of weeks ago when he made his debut in the Non-Fat Yogurt, and we have done a What's the Deal with episode with Lloyd Braun uh, a couple few, about four years ago. And we all have also interviewed the actor Matt McCoy, who plays him in the episode. We also did that in 2017. But I feel like with Lloyd, I guess we can just touch on the fact that in the first, obviously the Non-Fat Yogurt, the first episode he's in, you know, he's, like we mentioned, he's a successful advisor to Mayor Dinkins and you know he's very suave he's sophisticated he's charismatic and then you know after the whole name tag gate fiasco sort of thing you know he kind of goes down and we we hypothesized he's blacklisted you know from like any political jobs or anything corporate so he's basically like done for career wise we see in the gum he's had his uh, therapy and he's you know Lloyd you can see he's not quite there you know mentally but he does have some kind of you know semblance of conscience and you know understanding and even a bit of empathy at times but I think in the Serenity Now in this episode you can see he's basically lost any semblance of humanity yeah I, I think you're right it's, it's been a bit of a roller coaster like you said in um, yeah in the non-fat yoga you know he's at the top of the world he's killing it professionally he's mm. doing really well and obviously the fall of Dinkins and his downfall is uh, you know more than just a job loss it's sort of everything that he his whole identity everything is gone mm. you know the respect self-respect prestige the access all of it gone and uh, he He's still, he's still sort of, he's still fairly at the bottom in the gum, but you can see signs, like you said, of him coming back up. You know, he's, he's on the upswing. But then yeah. in this episode, you know, he's completely he's gone from reality. He's gone mentally detached. Yeah. yeah, he's detached. Like he he rings the bell yeah. and he the phone isn't even connected. Yep. And he's pretending like he either has like schizophrenia where he yep. thinks people are talking to him on the phone yep. or maybe he has like, he has that determination and drive, you know, to beat George and to be like a good business person or like good in like in his job. So yep. maybe he like, I don't know, maybe in his mind, he's talking to people and he still has that ambition to work but he's not actually talking to real people yeah it's one of the two really yeah i I think so i guess the only sign of sanity in this episode is you know at the end he says you know when he talks about the serenity now thing and he shows a bit of self-awareness by saying you know that's that's what happened to me you know i tried it and it failed and that's how i ended up in a you know a psych facility mental institution you know so he's got some self-awareness so he's not completely detached from reality he understands his own situation and what caused it the only thing that occurred to me another thing that occurred to me is that you know because george was like you know half jokingly like they say you put a, a a family in your freezer and he's like serenity now insanity later and when he says insanity later his face kind of darkens a bit and his tone yeah serious but it almost looks like he's just sort of messing with george and the only thing that i thought maybe maybe he's just maybe he is like recovered mostly and he's just doing the whole computer selling thing just to fuck with george he still maybe he still blames george indirectly for his downfall because he's friends with elaine you know there's that sort of oh there's that link yeah oh okay so you think it's you think it's deliberate He's deliberately well, if, doing it just if, to stir if George. So, if he's so deluded and he's not even aware that he's talking to no one and his phone's not plugged in, the next scene he shows so much clarity. He's like, no, no, well, this this is why I've fallen so far. You know, he shows so much clarity and self-awareness. It, it just sort of doesn't really line up with him oh. being, unless, unless, unless he said he's schizophrenic maybe and he sort of shifts in and out of connection to reality where one day he's very lucid and, and self-aware and then the next day he's just completely gone. I, I yeah. don't know, it just... The fact that, again, when he sort of messes with George a bit by saying serenity now and sanity later, that kind of seems like in line with the idea of him maybe just doing the whole computer sales thing just to mess with George. 
just to have another thing over him, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, kind of, I'm all, mm. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not saying that my idea is stronger than yours. I'm just saying there's kind mm. of evidence for many different takes, I think. Many different takes. Yeah, well, my take is I think Lloyd's gone nuts. And I yep. think with the whole insanity later thing, like obviously, you know, yeah, he probably has days where he's lucid and then he's, you know, gone, like, like you yeah. said. But I, I feel like, yeah, he's basically leaned to like the insane part more than the same yep. part. So he does have some kind of semblance of sanity in his mind but he's basically I think he's basically gone over the edge so right. he says serenity now and sanity later so I think George says the rumour of the family in the freezer it, it can be implied to the audience that he did actually kill a family and put him in his freezer there is an interesting fan theory that uh, Lloyd Braun was actually the lopper which I think is kind of kind of fun Oh, yeah, that is a fun one. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah so mean, that means he'd still, like, because I think the Lopper, the Frogger comes out later in season nine, like about halfway, I think halfway through the season or maybe a, like in the second half. Yep. I, I, it'd be interesting how Lloyd, you know, Lloyd is kind of one of those, I guess we could say he's kind of like a functioning psychopath. Like he's able to like live day to day, but he has like murderous tendencies. That sounds fun. Yeah, I mean, as fun as <laughs> murderous tendencies can be. Um, <laughs> yeah, in like a comedic sense in a, in yeah, a comedy yeah, show. Yeah. 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 yeah, the lover. I love Braun being the lover. That sounds that sounds good. I haven't yeah, heard that one before. I can't. I can't even remember where I heard it, but uh, I just thought you know, kind of, it doesn't line up like exactly, but uh, you know, it's it's a fun thing to consider. Yeah, that that does sound fun. Makes it interesting. Yeah, for sure. I didn't have anything else on Lloyd Braun. Uh, do you have any other notes no. on any other secondaries? Uh, no, I think you've already, you, we were going to talk about Frank Costanza and his obsession with computers, but I guess it's already implied like he watched the net and, yep. you know, he said it was an intriguing film and he got inspired to a provocative film yep. and uh, he got inspired to sell computers. But I mean, like that's quite smart by Frank because at that yeah. time, you know, like home PCs had been around for what, 10, 15 years prior to that, you know, they hit the mainstream, like, uh, like mid to late eighties, they yeah. became a thing. And so Frank was kind of riding the wave of like the dot, the future dot com boom and, you know, you know, like the dot, everything was like dot com, you know, every website, you know, there was more like, you know, Amazon was coming up and, and all that stuff. So it was actually, it was quite a forward thinking idea for Frank to sell computers. Yeah, I think, I think Frank, him deciding to get back into a business because he hasn't shown, you know, he was a, a uh, what was his job? Was he? He, uh, he was in, he was a, a cook in Korea. Oh, no, no. But his main job, wasn't he a salesman? Because he always used to be oh, he was a salesman in Korea. Yeah, he went to yeah. Korea and that's how he met the woman who he had an affair with. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think, mm. you know, and then he retired, but he's never really, I can't recall any previous episodes where he's shown any sort of like business acumen beyond retirement. No. You know, unlike, say, Morty, Morty Seinfeld, who's always willing to like do a deal if the opportunity presents itself. He's still got that like willingness to be a salesman. Whereas Frank is like, well, I'm retired. I'm not like that anymore. I don't really have any aspirations for that or I don't want to be that anymore. But the fact that Frank is willing to try a pretty ridiculous technique to calm himself did he say that his therapist recommended it or his friend i think it was either his i think it was his doctor or, or oh no his yeah. therapist yeah his therapist I think, I think no no sorry no like no that. no he got a, a cassette tape recommended by his oh, therapist i'm quite sure but the cassette tape knowing frank you know the cassette tape probably just said just calmly say serenity now not like blast yeah. it <laughs> so he misinterpreted the whole thing i think just following you know the general timeline of frank's life in the last four seasons of Seinfeld, you know, at the start, like his, his, you know, insanity and complete, like just anger is, you know, the, the through line for Frank and Estelle. But, you know, Frank starts out completely like unaware of how crazy he is. He thinks that everyone else is sort of, he's almost paranoid and he's very angry and just sort of like cantankerous. But then mm. he splits up with Estelle and, you know, he's obviously a bit upset by that. And then they go back together and that's all good. I think Maybe the marriage and the split up, oh, sorry, the, the the split up and then the reconciliation made him consider life a bit more and maybe want to mm. improve his life a bit more. And, you know, he's like, well, maybe I can do like a business, you know, that, that will, you know, make a bit more money. It's a challenge. You know, I'm learning some new skills. I don't know anything about computer. And also the fact that he's willing to listen to like a self-help tape and try a, you know, a fairly ridiculous way to calm himself. To me, that all sort mm. of paints a picture of maybe he's on a bit of a self-improvement kick or, you know, he's just trying to expand his boundaries or, or just push himself out of his comfort zone uh, in whatever way he can and just, you know, just move forward a bit because of the toll that his split up and reconciliation took on him. You know, it's pretty common yeah. for people to, to examine their life after a traumatic and, and, and um, you know, chaotic event. You sort of take stock and you're like, well, who do I want to be? What do I want to 
to do? How do I want to spend my time? And to me, it sort of lines up that Frank would be in that sort of frame of mind and trying stuff out like the computer business, like the self-help with the serenity now at this point in his life. Yeah. In his twilight years, he's got another, what, 10, 20 years to go. Yeah. You know, and I think that's just another little part of the, you know, long and winding and hilarious tale that is Frank Costanza. That is Frank Costanza. And he becomes a computer entrepreneur before it fails. It just seems like he's experimenting a bit. You know, he's just trying things out seeing what works, what doesn't. You know, he's, he's trying to be a bit more inspired, trying to push his boundaries a bit more. I just think he's just, he's in that sort of frame of mind where you just, you want to you want to get out of your comfort zone a bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've gone so deep with these characters. We have, it's crazy. We? This, this is a real yeah. deep dive. This is the psychology hour on Binwa Basque. <laughs> anyway that were all the secondary characters man let's have one more break and when we come back we're going to wrap up our third last ever episode of this podcast we're going to find out where the serenity now sits in our episodes we have done so far and if any of today's newer secondary characters make our top 20 serenity now thing doesn't work just bottles up the anger and then eventually you blow what do you know you were in the nut house what do you think put me there i heard they found a family in your freezer Serenity now, and sanity later. The Serenity Now, our third last episode of Bid Wabask and the final season nine episode we are ever going to do. Where does it appear in your list of episodes we've reviewed so far? So out of 167, my friend, it is number 58. Okay, that's not a bad spot. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not bad. I mean, yeah, it's this wacky and obviously season eight started the whole wacky, you know, storyline ideas and then season nine kind of cements it. Um, yeah, I just like how, uh, you know, uh, the Serenity Now is probably one of the most famous lines that Frank will ever say. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it was just, it was a funny, it was a good episode. It was, uh, it was very good in parts and it hit quite a bit. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. For me, it's number 38, so a bit higher. Than okay. What yep. I really liked about the episode is that it definitely had a season nine vibe. You know, it was a tiny bit more wacky, but it wasn't as mm. wacky as most season nine episodes. It was a bit more grounded. You know, it was it was mostly in Jerry's apartment. There was no sort of like, the only wacky like prop or thing that happened, I guess, is that Kramer got a screen door and, uh, you know, he became a bit of a, a slightly different person because of the screen door. But other than that, it's I think it's fairly grounded. Yeah, fair, <laughs> yeah fairly grounded in reality. Yeah, Kramer became- came like someone who lives in like a rural area yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or a trailer park or something yeah which had more of it i think i think kramer's storyline is probably the most season nine ish but uh, oh yeah you know, very, elaine, very. elaine elaine having a shiksa appeal jerry being emotionally open and uh you know george having a rival with lloyd braun doesn't seem as as uh wacky as most season nine storylines i think it's just reminded me it was a good mix i think of wacky and grounded yeah i mean the dialogue was certainly wacky but yeah the most of the ideas were grounded in reality yeah yeah that's right do any of today's newer secondary characters make your top 20? Uh, no, but uh, shout out no. to Patty for, you know, being the person that uh, cracked Jerry's very high emotional wall. Yeah, and big thanks to George for putting Jerry back to where he used to be. <laughs> yeah, we needed that reset. It's almost like a classic sitcom where, you know, there's a big change in a character or like a big consequential event and then somehow magically it just resolves itself at the end of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's like when George becomes like all emotional and stuff. I think, you know, him seeing Frank in the uh, credits scene, I think that probably, you know, he just saw his dad and then he uh, went back to his old self. Oh, it brings him That's right what did back. it. Brings him right back. That was it. <laughs> that undid everything. Yep, for sure. Anyway, that was our third last ever episode of Bidbobas. Thank you so much for listening. If you do want to reach out to us, you know, you can always send us an email or find us on social media. Our email address is bidbobaskpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Reddit, as well as Discord and TikTok at B-I-D-W-B-A-S-C. You can support us financially on Patreon and PayPal as well. All those details are in the show notes. And next week, Steve, we are doing our final season six episode and our penultimate episode of Bidwa Basque, The Doodle. Yeah, The Doodle. Uh, I can't really remember that episode, so I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I said at the top of the episode that we do have a guest next week. Uh, we'll be having a author who got in touch with us recently. He goes by the name of Mitch, and uh, he's gearing up to release a book that he's just written. It's a collection of essays about Seinfeld and the, the various different aspects of the show. And uh, that collection of essays is called Not That There's Anything Wrong With That. So uh, yeah, next week we'll have uh, Mitch on and we'll be talking about The Doodle, so that should be really fun. Yeah, and there's some pretty interesting essays in there. I mean, he talks, he actually does a power ranking for all the secondary characters or most of the big secondary characters, which of course is right up our alley and uh, yeah, a few other topics as well. So uh, yeah, we'll have him on and he can talk about it while we talk about the doodle. Yeah, that's right. So he'll have watched the doodle as well. So he'll be, uh, you know, giving his takes on the secondary characters from that episode, but um, no doubt we'll ask him a bunch of questions about his book and and talk about that as well. So uh, yeah, something a bit different and uh, should be really sweet. Indeed. My name's Ivan. I'm Stephen. And we'll catch you next week for the doodle 
Bougainville and our second last episode of the pod. Take care of yourselves and each other. (laughs) 